Great. Thanks, Graham, for that introduction. Thanks, all of you, for coming. Thanks to the Friends Group for supporting this. I think this is my third or fourth time here. Anyway, thanks for coming. Uh, I had to travel a great distance from Marblehead to get here. It was very, very, <laughs> very difficult. Everybody tells me you can't get to Marblehead from anywhere, but uh, the whole North Shore seems to have similar, similar issues. But anyway, thanks a lot for coming. A Left 4 Dead, it's a true story of a wild and fateful encounter between an American sealing vessel, not sa it's a sailing vessel, but it's a sealing vessel, a shipwrecked British brig and a British warship uh, on the Falkland Islands during the War of 1812. Fraught with misunderstanding and mistrust, the incident left three British sailors and two Americans stranded on the windy and inhospitable Falklands for a year and a half. And that included, among those five who were stranded, that included the captain of the sealing vessel, Charles H. Barnard. It's a tale involving British and Americans meeting under the most stressful circumstances in a time of war. Kindness and compassion, drunkenness, the birth of a child, treachery, greed, lying, a hostile takeover, stellar leadership, ingenuity, severe privation, the great value of a good dog, perseverance, endurance, threats, bullying, banishment, a perilous 1,200 mile journey in a 17 and a half foot boat, an improbable rescue mission in a rickety ship, and legal battles over a dubious and disgraceful wartime prize. And yes, that is a sentence, an actual sentence from my book. And if that turns you off, don't read the rest of the book. No, that, no, that, that's one of the longest sentences. I, I just, I, I liked it. My editor wanted to cut it up. I said, no. So, but anyway, uh, the centerpiece for the book is the Falkland Islands, uh, an extremely cold and windy place. In the winter months, the average temperature is 36 degrees. In the summer, the average is 49 degrees, but what really makes it difficult to live there is that the average wind speed is 18 miles per hour. So if you add 18 miles per hour to 36 degrees, that puts you in the mid to upper 20s all the time. It's a sprawling archipelago of 700 islands, only about 200 if you get rid of most of the islands that are not visible at high tide. It's located roughly 300 miles to the east of the tip of South America and the Strait of Magellan. Now the Falkland Islands have a stark beauty and I wanted to mention most of the color images here are taken by Georgina Strange who grew up on New Island which you'll hear about in a little bit. Uh, she's a wonderful photographer down there and if you ever want to visit the Falklands and want to go on a great trip make sure you sign up for a cruise that keeps her, that uh, places her on the boat or on land. She's a really interesting person. The rugged landscape is undeniably spectacular and if you could see this image up close, there are black-browed albatross pairs all along that rock. And in fact, the Falklands has 700,000 black-browed albatrosses, the highest concentration anywhere in the world. And as you'll see later, the albatrosses had an impact on the men who were left on the Falkland Islands. Here's a settlement rookery in a storm. And this is one of my favorite images, just gives you a sense of how different the environment is there in the Falklands. And back then in the early 1800s, the Falklands didn't have a single tree 
Uh, today there are trees, but they were planted by subsequent settlers. Now the flora as well, such as this sea cabbage and this wild celery and the fauna are also striking. This image taken by Georgina is actually on one of the postage stamps in the Falkland Islands. Now with regards to Left for Dead, the most important animals on the Falklands are the seals, the first seals and the sea lions. Barnard and his crew of 12 men, along with his trusty dog Scent, left New York Harbor and headed to the Falklands on the 73 foot long brig Nanina on April 12, 1812 hoping to strike it rich by gathering a hold full of seal skins which could be sold in China for anywhere between 35 cents and five dollars a piece. And that may not sound impressive. That is a fair amount of money back then, but keep in mind that between the late 1700s and the early 1800s, American sealers as well as ones from other countries killed on the order of two and a half to three million seals. So multiply that and you can see why it was a rather large business. Not as big as the whaling business, but there were quite a few ships that were involved in sealing. But it wasn't only the seal skins they were after, they also planned to kill sea elephants, strip them of their blubber, and render it all down. Uh, that blubber burned bright and clean, and actually it was second only to spermaceti oil, which came from the head of a sperm whale, second only in terms of illumination potential as well as the price. So they hope to get a bunch of those. And one thing I'll tell you is that the reason they are called elephant seals has nothing to do with their great bulk, although that would make sense. It's because the Europeans who first saw them noticed that proboscis, and it reminded them of a trunk of an elephant. Now the Nina arrived at New Island on the western edge of the uninhabited Falklands on September 7th of 1812 and moored in Hooker's Harbor, which is shown here. Hooker's Harbor. This is one of the three maps that I had made for the book by a, an artist in New York City, David Kane. This is the third book that I've worked with him to get maps. Now Barnard took a great chance leaving New York uh, just as Congress placed a 90-day embargo on shipping in the expectation that war was going to break out between the United States and Great Britain. And the reason that you put an embargo in place is to give ships that are at sea time enough to come back to port before the hostilities begin. Uh, but they, the Nina left right as the embargo was being put in place. The war hadn't broken out yet. But on January 3rd, 1813, after the Nanina had been in the Falklands for a couple of months, they discovered that the war had begun the previous June when a whale ship from America, the Hope, stopped by New Island to inform Barnard of that event. Now, the contract that Barnard had signed with the owners of the vessel, John Murray and Sons, required him to immediately sail back to the United States should war break out. But Barnard and his men decided to do something else. They decided to stay in the Falklands for another year, continue sealing, because they figured maybe the war will be over within a year. And if we head back now, there's a good likelihood that we're going to be captured by a British ship. So we'd rather spend that year on the Falklands than in a British prison. But they couldn't stay at New Island because it was frequented by British whale ships during times of war. And especially in the War of 1812, a lot of British whale ships in the Pacific Ocean, not so much the Atlantic Ocean, were armed with cannons and given instructions to attack American whale ships and other American merchant ships and take them as prizes. So Barnard was concerned that if they stayed on New Island and a British whale ship came by, or any British ship for that matter, they would be taken as a prize because the Nina was very lightly defended, had no cannons on board at all. So Barnard decided to go all the way over to here to Barnard's Harbor. And as you can see, Barnard was a little arrogant. He named the harbor after himself, an island after himself. Uh, he's an interesting character. So they went over there and they continued sealing assuming that they were the only people on the Falklands. And they were for a while, but in April, they discovered that they were not alone. Months earlier, on December 4th of 1812, the 193-ton brig Isabella sailed from Port Jackson Harbor, or Sydney Harbor as you know it, 
in the British penal colony of New South Wales or Australia, which today is part, well, it's today part of Australia. This, this is a contemporary drawing or engraving of uh, Port Jackson Harbor right around the 18 teens, a thriving place already filled with <laughs> British reprobates and convicts. No, anyway, the, brig, the brig's destination was London via Cape Horn. In addition to, the cargo of, to a cargo of seal skins, whale oil, and mother of pearl shells, which were used to make buttons back then, the Isabella had 54 people on board, including 34 passengers, 14 of whom were armed Royal Marines going home on leave, and 10 were pardoned convicts, or ones who had served out their time, and that included four former female prostitutes. After nearly crashing into an island south of New Zealand, the Isabella had a tempestuous ride around Cape Horn, and on February 8th, the Isabella crashed onto a reef on Eagle Island, part of the Falkland Islands, uh, and finally came to a rest on a rock ledge close to shore, a complete wreck. And if you read the book, you'll discover that the reason for the Isabella's travails, both south of New Zealand and then crashing in the Falklands, had everything to do with a drunkard captain who preferred to spend time in his cabin uh, either playing cards, drinking, or laying about with one of the prostitutes that he had taken a fancy to. Okay, so this is the end map in the book. When you open it up, you'll see it. And these are all the different voyages that I describe in the book down there, that key. Here is Eagle Island. Keep in mind that Barnard and the Americans are up here, um, Eagle Island is down here. There's the site of the shipwreck, and there's a reef. Eagle Island, Speedwell Island today, is owned by Chris and Lindsay May. And uh, Chris helped me. He got, provided some pictures and some information trying to determine exactly where the wreck had taken place. He owns that entire island, and he and his wife live there alone. Yeah. Well, not alone. They live with 60,000 sheep. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Now, miraculously, all the people on board made it uh, ashore from right about there, and none died. And in the ensuing days, they offloaded most of the cargo and created a little settlement they called Newtown Providence. And this is one of the pictures that Chris sent me. To give you a sense, that's a very large anchor. It is 12 feet long. It's hard to get the perspective. And if you had both uh, spades or the, the both tips of the anchor, it would be almost six or seven feet across. So it was a rather large anchor. A few weeks later, the survivors sent six men off in a 17 and a half foot boat to try to find salvation. First in the Falklands, they thought there was a British or a Spanish settlement there, but they didn't know that those had both left prior to the War of 1812. But if they didn't find anybody by circuiting the Falklands, then the goal was to sail from here all the way up to Buenos Aires, 1,200 miles in a 17 and a half foot open boat. They nearly got knocked over by a whale at one point. Uh, it's, it's a very, there's a whole chapter in the book that's about that, that voyage. It's just fascinating that they made it. Now, when they got to Buenos Aires, they met with a guy who was the commander of the HMS Nereus on station, a guy named Peter Haywood, who was a survivor of the mutiny on the bounty. He, there's an interesting story about him. He claims that he wasn't part of the mutiny. Bly later testified that he was. He was brought back from Tahiti and then Australia. They crashed in Australia. Anyway, he was led off ultimately and he went back uh, to be the head of the station in Buenos Aires. And Peter Haywood immediately launched a rescue mission to get the castaways on the Falkland Islands. And remember, he has no knowledge that there are any Americans there whatsoever because when the 17 and a half foot boat left, it didn't know about the Americans yet. So this, uh, this Nancy, the HMS Nancy that was sent down to get the castaways had dozens of armed men on board and it was headed up by a guy named Lieutenant William Peter Duranda. In the meantime, while that rescue mission was coming down, a bunch of things 
had happened on the Falkland Islands. And there were some dramatic turns. This is the map that was prepared by Charles Bernard of the Falkland Islands. He'd actually been to the Falkland Islands before on other sealing voyages and probably had more knowledge than anybody in the world at that time about its topography and navigating in and around its many islands. So in early April of 1813, Barnard and a few of his men were taking the young Nanina, which is a shallop, a smaller boat that was used to travel from the Nanina, the, the mother ship, so to speak, and to go to islands and kill seals and bring them back. They were in the young Nanina and they were in Fox Bay looking for seals when they noticed smoke rising off of Eagle Island, about 25 miles away. Upon investigating, they came upon Newtown Providence and the castaways from the Isabella. Despite the fact that the Americans and the British were at war, Barnard and his men decided to do the humanitarian, noble, and correct thing. They offered to save all of the castaways, transport them to South America, where they could possibly get a ship to England, despite the fact that the two countries were at war. And the only thing that Barnard and his men asked for in return, since they had to forego the rest of their sealing voyage, which had already been somewhat profitable, was the right to the cargo of the Isabella and anything they could strip from the wreck. This is actually an engraving that was in a book that Charles Barnard published in 1829 that depicts what the artist at least thought Newtown Providence looked like. And I can guarantee you after reading descriptions of it, it didn't look that neat and, and orderly and nice. Uh, their, their huts were made out of sod, uh, hacked out of the ground, a few rocks and uh, tussock grass and uh, some sails and uh, beams that they pulled off of the Isabella. So, uh, you know, so the castaways, now the castaways greatly outnumbered the Americans. Keep that in mind. Not only did they outnumber them, but 14 of them were Marines who had guns. Um, so the British enthusiastically accepted the Americans' offer. But then Barnard realized that these British people had no idea that the war had broken out. And he felt that it was necessary to tell them before inking this deal because he worried should they find out later if one of his men let that secret slip, they would feel as if they had been duped. And since there were so many more of them, they could easily have overpowered the Americans. So Barnard and the others told the British that war had broken out. And despite that, all the British, except for a couple of scurrilous characters you'll have to read about, uh, were fine with that. They said, great, that's, you know, Thanks, thanks for saving us. Okay, leaving uh, some of his men behind on Eagle Island, Barnard took the young Nanina and 22 of the British castaways back to Barnard's Harbor to get the Nanina ready to leave the Falklands. On May 3rd, 1813, the young Nanina was reunited with the Nanina down there on Double Creek West Arm. And actually, getting back to the Nanina was quite difficult because the weather was bad. They weren't able to sail directly. So actually, uh, Barnard and a couple of his men took about 20 of the British, and they had to hike overland to get to the Nanina, and then where he could get some more of his crew to go back around the water route and pick up some of the women and children who remain down here in Arch Islands Harbor. So at this very same moment that they're getting the Nanina ready, you know, putting the rigging back together, the sails, getting it ready to sail, uh, Commander Duranda, William Peter Duranda, and the Nancy reached Eagle Island. His arrival dramatically altered the Americans and the Britons' plans. Duranda immediately tossed aside the agreement that had been reached between the Americans and the British, and he said that he was going to declare the young Nanina and the Nina prizes of war, and all of the Americans were going to be made prisoners of war. Some of the castaways felt that that was abominable behavior, especially given how warmly the Americans had received them and their magnanimous gesture to save the British. But despite their feelings, none of the British castaways stood up against Duranda. But first came the shallop, came back to Eagle Island, came right in here to Jack's Harbor. It was on May 16th, and it was promptly declared a prize, and all the Americans on board were placed 
in essentially prison on land. They were made prisoners of war. As the days turned into weeks, Duranda started to worry because the people on the young Nanina had told him that the Nanina was coming right after. But this is the depth of winter, or right at the beginning of winter, a lot of bad weather, and the days turned into weeks, and Duranda began to fear that the Nanina, his big prize, had foundered and would never come back to Eagle Island. Well, it hadn't foundered, but something quite troubling had occurred. Atrocious weather and adverse winds kept the Nanina from going back to Eagle Island right away. They ended up going from Barnard's Harbor over here to New Island. First, they went into Ship Harbor or Coffin Harbor. Today, they, they went, and, but the weather was so bad, their anchors were being dragged that they decided, Barnard said, you know, we have to go to a more protected anchorage. And uh, he first asked the British if that would be okay. Basically, he thought, Barnard thought it was foolish to risk trying to go to Eagle Island. They needed to hold up, hold up in a harbor for maybe weeks or even months before they made that trip. And he recommended to Captain Robert Dury, shown here, he's the guy who was in charge of all the British Marines. He recommended they move the Nanina to a more protected harbor. Dury agreed. He said he'd rather stay in a protected harbor for three months than to try to brave this weather to get to Eagle Island. And it's a funny story. Captain Dury's ancestors, uh, descendants gave me this image to use in the book. And they knew what was coming because Captain Dury does not come off too well in this book. And I remember talking to Robert Dury, who he has an honorary title that his great, 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 whatever, had gotten. And he was quick to point out, we have an honorary title, but we have no money. So, and, and, he, and judging by his, this, his, uh, his ancestor's behavior, he doesn't have much to brag about either. So, but anyway. Uh, Dury agreed that, that that was a prudent course, that we should stay on New Island. They went over to Hooker's Harbor, and they moored close to shore. Just over a week later, during a break in the wretched, in wretched weather, Charles proposed using the Nanina's jolly boat, small boat, smaller than a whale boat, uh, to take a small party to neighboring Beaver Island to hunt hogs and replenish provisions. Those hogs were not native to the Falklands. They had been placed there by earlier mariners in pairs in the hope that they would mate and create a bigger population that people could draw upon in later years when they were traveling the world's oceans. And it worked. There were a lot of hogs on certain islands, but not all of them. Now, just minutes after Barnard proposed this hunting trip, all of the British came forward and demanded that the Nanina proceed immediately to Eagle Island. Barnard told them the time was not right, the weather was still not that good. When we get back in a couple of days, we'll go. You know, cool your jets. Although he didn't say that, <laughs> as far as I know. Uh, the British, the British uh, dropped their demand. Believing that things were under control, Barnard asked for volunteers to go on his hunting trip. One American, a guy named Jacob Green, stepped forward. And that's another interesting part of the book, although unfortunately, I don't have a lot of information about their personalities. But of the 13 men on the Nanina, seven of them were black men, almost all of whom came from the tip of Long Island, the Sag Harbor area. And they, they, a lot of them were good mariners. In fact, uh, Barnard said Jacob Green was one of the best mariners he'd ever, ever worked with. So Jacob Green came forward, and then three of the British sailors came forward to go on this humanitarian, another humanitarian mission to go get food to bring back to all the people in Barnard's Harbor who were fast running out of food. So they left for Beaver Island, which is right there. They're up here. They left for Beaver Island on June 11th, and they took minimal supplies along because they only expected to be gone for a few days. On June 13th, the British renewed their demand that the Nina set sail without delay now that the fair weather had returned. Barnard's father, and Barnard's father was on the ship, Valentine, almost uh, he was 63 years old. The guy had multiple hernias, was wearing two trusses, 
which from what I understand are basically super support doc, uh, you know, apparel that help keep your body in one piece. And you have to read the book to see why he was there making such a difficult voyage at age of 63. But anyway, Barnard stepped forward and he pro protested. He said, come on. We can't leave now. Let's wait for the hunting party to get back, and then we'll leave once they come back. The British wouldn't have it, and they stood fast. Growing more alarmed, Valentine pleaded with Captain Robert Dury, you remember him, to rein in the British. And, uh, but he didn't, he didn't uh, heed Valentine's warnings. In fact, he sided with the other castaways, stating, that he had no objection to the brig proceeding. Shocked by this answer, Valentine responded, your Marines are under your charge, and I demand of you assistance. And if you do not assist me, I conclude that you take charge, and you shall be accountable for whatever happens. Unfortunately for Valentine and the missing men in the hunting party, Dury lacked a spine of steel. I don't think his descendants are going to like that sentence. <laughs> I haven't heard from him. They have a copy of the book, but anyway. Okay, he ignored Valentine's plea. Over the continued objections of the Americans, the Marines prepared the Nanina for departure. On June 14th, they were ready to set sail. One of the Americans, another captain on board, and this is another interesting part of the story, there were four captains on board the American ship, only one of whom, Charles Bernard, was acting as captain. And there are some interesting reasons as to why you had four captains of former vessels on the same ship. And you're asking for trouble if you do that anyway. C captains back then, even today, but captains back then, they expected to be you know, listen to, you give a command, and when you got four people who are used to leading men, it can be very difficult. So anyway, the, the Marines prepared the Nanina for departure, and on June 14, they were ready to sail, but one of the American captains, a guy named Barzillai Pease, now that is a name you don't see very often anymore, <laughs> Barzillai, I love that name. Anyway, Barzillai realized that the British knew nothing about the Falkland Islands. They didn't know how to sail its treacherous waters, so he offered to take the helm to sail the Nanina back to Eagle Island on one condition. The British had to stop at Beaver Island and pick up the hunting party. Well, the British agreed, but when the Nanina drew abreast of Beaver Island, the British reneged on their deal. They refused to send the boat or even briefly come to anchor. All they did is fire two shots quickly and then sailed off. Valentine pleaded with the British to do more, making clear that to leave the hunting, par hunting party on the island in the depth of a dreadfully severe winter without food, raiment, or shelter was the equivalent of a death sentence. Unmoved, the British sailed off. But when the Nanina arrived at Eagle Island, Duranda claimed it as a prize and placed all the Americans under arrest as prisoners of war. This is Jack's Harbor, the north part of Eagle Island. It's pretty desolate. That's a, this is a modern picture. Um, just imagine what it was like during the War of 1812 and there are a couple of ships there and people traipsing back and forth. It's, uh, it's a tough environment to live in. Only about 5,000 people live on the Falklands today. Uh, the most plausible explanation for Duranda's decision to take the Nanina and the young Nanina as prizes is that he was motivated purely by the glory of capturing a prize of war and collecting, more importantly, collecting the profit that would ensue from the sale of the ships and their cargo. In the coming weeks, the Americans begged Duranda to send a search party to find and retrieve the hunting party. But Duranda kept saying no. Finally, he agreed, and he sent a few men on a very short search, less than three days, and they only made it as far as Fox Bay. Instead of going all the way around Cape Orford and the other capes to Beaver Island, about 80 or 90 miles away where they thought the hunting party was. So they came back. They were unsuccessful. On July 22nd, exactly 170 days after the Isabella slammed ashore and 44 days since the five-man hunting party had been left on Beaver Island, the Nancy and the Nanina left the Falkland Islands. The uh, 
The young Nanina was quickly lost. They had it on a tow rope behind the Nanina, but it was making sailing the Nanina very difficult, and it was a storm, and basically the rope severed, and so goodbye the young Nanina. But they still had the Nanina. The passengers and crew on the two vessels could only imagine what had happened to the hunting party that they left behind. But what they imagined was almost certainly not as dramatic as what actually occurred. The hunt on Beaver Island had gone well, and in a few days, the jolly boat was loaded to the gunwales with bloody carcasses of hogs and a lot of dead geese. But when on June, late on June 14th, they got back sort of in the evening, they were greeted with an alarming sight on New Island. The Nanina was gone. A frantic search at dawn turned up nothing. Refusing to believe that he and the other four men had been barbarously deserted, Barnard seized on another explanation. The, the Nanina must have gone back to Beaver Island, but just looked in the wrong place, went on the wrong side of the island. So they missed the hunting party. So this rekindled the men's hopes and they dragged the boat into the water and sailed off once again. This time they entered the main harbor on the eastern side of Beaver Island. And you can see Beaver Island in the distance there. Upon entering the harbor, as Barnard later recalled, they experienced the almost insupportable anguish of neither finding the brig nor discovering any trace that she had been there. They had been cruelly abandoned at the beginning of a Falklands winter with little to sustain them and no explanation of why they had been left in such a horrendous predicament. On June 15th, the men latched onto one final hope. The Nanina must have gone back to Eagle Island. On such a slender reed, Charles and the others placed their faith. For more than a month, and that's what some of these voyages are, for more than a month, Barnard and the rest of the hunting party tried valiantly to sail back to Eagle Island. But on their first attempt, they got hopelessly lost. They actually ended up going all up here. They had some adventures. They wanted, keep in mind, they wanted to go down here. And Barnard, who knew the, the Falklands very well, he got lost. It was bad weather, it was cloudy, it was, there was snow, and he got hopelessly turned around. So their first effort ended in failure. Then they went over to Swan Island. They tried again. Their, their idea was to go down to here, hike across here, dragging the boat, get into here, and then go there. Because this, this is, as Barnard called it, is an iron-bound coast. And Cape Orford and Cape Meredith, very dangerous waters there and they didn't want to risk doing that in the middle of winter. Anyway, so the second attempt, they, they became emaciated right about here, and they finally went back to Swan Island and set up a rudimentary camp. After the Nancy and the Nanina left Eagle Island, they split up. The Nancy headed to Buenos Aires, and then Duranda made his way to Rio de Janeiro, where the Nanina was waiting for him. In Rio, Rear Admiral Sir Manley Dixon, and I always thought that was a great name for a rear admiral, Manly Dixon, <laughs> met with Duranda and the Americans and decided that a great injustice had occurred. Duranda, he argued, should never have claimed the Nanina as a prize, and the Americans shouldn't have been made prisoners of war. The Americans had acted nobly, agreeing to save the castaways, and he was greatly troubled by the way in which the Americans were treated and the disgraceful act of abandoning the hunting party, just like the disgraceful act of that man abandoning my talk. He just walked out. Uh -oh. <laughs> that was good timing. No, no, I'm, it's, not dis it's not disgraceful. If you have to, if you have to leave, go ahead. I, I've had a lot worse happen to me in talks. Anyway, Dixon wanted to make a deal with Valentine Barnard in which the Americans would get back the Nanina minus the Isabella's cargo. But despite much back and forth, agreement remained elusive. And Dixon finally grew so frustrated with these negotiations that he threw up his hands and he ordered the Nanina be sent back to London where a court could decide what its disposition should be. While Valentine was still negotiating with Dixon, 
The other Americans made their way back home on various vessels, taking many, many months to get there. They had a copy with them of a protest that they had all written and signed while they were in Rio de Janeiro and given to the local American consul and was also sent on to our State Department, which outlined all the horrible things that have happened since they were in the Falklands and what the British did to them. So soon after the Americans returned to the United States, the protest was printed in numerous newspapers with the eye-catching title, British Inhumanity. And it had this following paragraph introduction, which I'll read to you. We request the attention of the reader to the following account of the almost unparalleled ingratitude and treachery of the crew of a British ship to the crew of an American vessel, the latter having saved the lives of the former whose vessel had been wrecked. And they, in return for this humane act, seized and made prize of the vessel and property and the property of their preservers. Were it not that such a nation as Britain existed, this act of treachery might be correctly styled unparalleled. But British history is full of incidents of such black ingratitude. Such conduct, even in our enemy, cannot fail to call forth the indignant feelings of every American who has a drop of patriotic blood flowing in his veins. We need to write like that more often. No. Now, this is during the War of 1812, so we were still rather upset with the British. And uh, uh, if you are British, I apologize. But America's got a horrible history, too. In fact, any country, if you look deeply enough, there's a lot of things that they should be sorry for. Now, when the owners of the Ninina <coughs> learned what had happened, there was little they could do. The war was still raging, and that precluded a rescue mission to the Falklands. Of course, none of the Americans had any idea what had happened to the hunting party. In fact, nobody knew what had happened to the hunting party. But had they known, they would have been amazed and impressed. The men of the hunting party survived on their own from June 12, 1813 through November 25th, 1814, a total of 534 days, most of the time living on New Island. They made shoes and clothes out of seal skins. They subsisted mainly on a diet of hogs, geese, seals, native plants, potatoes that had been planted by earlier mariners, and albatross and penguin eggs. Good thing for them they weren't concerned about cholesterol because they ate an enormous number of eggs. And they built a rudimentary, rudimentary hut out of sod, driftwood, and the bones, ribs of whales. I can guarantee that this engraving, the, the hut they built did not look that nice. It, it was pretty big, though, eventually. They, they didn't quite finish it before. Well, you'll see what happens. OK. To cook and stay warm, they burned vines, driftwood, and peat underlying the dense growths of tussock grass. This is tussock grass. This is pretty small tussock grass. Tussock grass grows to be nine feet tall, can live for 200 years, and in fact, in fact, the first mariners that visited the Falklands thought they were palm trees when they saw them from far off, but beneath them there are thick mats of peat, like you know, peat bogs that have a very high organic content that can be burned almost like coal. During this long period, uh, Sorry, they keep scratching my eyes because my allergies are killing me. Anyway, during this long period, they got into a few fights, had many adventures and misadventures, and faced much adversity. They went on numerous hunts with their trusty dog, or Barnard's trusty dog, Scent, taking the lead. And this was a very dangerous endeavor, not just for the men, but for Scent in particular, because as you know, I sure you know, hogs have very large tusks. They're just large bottom and top teeth that uh, can grow to be six, seven inches long. And it, during these fights, Scent would rush out and he'd grab the hog by the ear or by the neck. And he'd try to hold on to give the men enough time to rush in and club and knife them to death. But Hog got speared with a tusk in the groin once, and then he had one of his eyes popped out by another tusk, but he kept on fighting. He never gave up. He was a very good dog. 
<laughs> so anyway, at one point, the other men abandoned Barnard without giving him any reasons why. They basically took almost everything, including scent, and just sailed off. So Barnard was turned into a real-life Robinson Crusoe for a couple of months. Now, he was a religious man. He was a Quaker, although he'd been kicked out of Quaker meeting up in Hudson, New York, because he married a non-Quaker, and he did it using a quote-unquote hireling priest. I'm not really sure what that is. I think it's just a sort of an itinerant uh, priest, but he still was religious and he, he really wanted his companions back because he got very lonely, so he welcomed them back bes bes never, even though they were rather duplicitous when they left. Now one of the men's most exciting and dangerous adventures was when they went sealing on the southwestern corner of New Island. They basically had to rappel down the, uh, the, the actual um, cliffs were 200 feet high. They weren't angled inward like this. That would have been too amazing. They actually were angled that way. So the men were able to use a rope that they had created from killing a bunch of old, large sea lions and peeling their skin off like the rind of an apple or orange in one strip and then raveling them together to make over 200 feet of rope and letting it dry for a couple of days. Uh, so they got down there, they could sort of rappel down, and they would kill the seals, skin them, take themselves and all the pelts up. Oh. Now the men's lonely and harsh existence on the Falkland Islands came to an end on November 25th, 1814, when the British whaling ships Indispensable and Asp arrived at New Island. Now they hadn't been looking for the castaways, although the British, who felt really bad about what happened to the hunting party, the British Navy had sent out a circular to the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, all the, all the stations where the British Navy was, saying if any of you go to the Falkland Islands, look for these five men who were part of this hunting party. The captain of the ASP had read that circular, but he totally forgot about it. The only reason he was in the Falklands was to stop off like many other mariners to get water and maybe some hogs. And then he saw these people waving to him from the, the land and he said, ah, you're the, the hunting party. So in the two ships departed the Falklands on November 29th, 1814. That was a stunning coincidence because in that very day in London, the prize appeal court was ruling on the disposition of the Nanina. The prize case appeared to be quite simple. Duranda, the captain of the HMS Nandy, Nancy, submitted his side of the story, and no one was there to dispute it. So the court ruled in his favor and said it was a valid prize of war, and he was going to be in line for most of the profits from selling it and its cargo. However, there was a year cooling off period, a year during which anybody can come forward and make an appeal and claim that this was an improper uh, condemnation of a ship. After the Treaty of Ghent was signed on December 24th, 1814, and the United States Senate ratified it the following February, John Murray and Sons, the owner of the Nina, were free to go to London to argue their case, and they did. They got there by June. With the help of a local barrister, Murray launched a legal attack. And the result, as a result, the Advocate General of the Civil Court urged Murray to appeal instantly the condemnation of the Nanina, stating that there is reason to think that the capture ought not to have been made. Appeal Murray did, his barrister submitting the proper paperwork on November 28, 1815, exactly one day before the one-year appeal period would have run out. Finally, on February 5th, 1818, because the wheels of British justice moved slowly, the, appeals court, the appeal court of the High Court of the Admiralty ruled in favor of the Murrays. They would be compensated for both the cost of the Nina and the cargo. And Duranda was left with nothing, and he complained about that for the rest of his life. <laughs> Barnard's journey back home was long and fascinating, and I think it's what, for me it was one of the most interesting parts of the book, because it details just how difficult it was in the early 1800s, the great age of sail, to get from one part of the world to the other, especially when you're picked up by a British whale ship, which has no interest in short-circuiting their own trip, 
you have to go along into the Pacific and go whaling with them. So ultimately, Barnard ended up with stops in Lima, the Sandwich Islands, or Hawaii, Canton, or Guangzhou, China, plus other adventures. At one point, he asked a British whaling captain to drop him off with a 17-year-old American on an uninhabited island in the Pacific so he could go sealing for a month and gather more pelts and hopefully make money because he knew when he, if he got back to New York, he was going to be bereft. Uh, so he, he did that. And finally, at the end of October 1816, Charles had the unspeakable happiness of being back home in New York and his family and the owners of the ship were shocked and very happy to see him alive. This, oops, did I just, I just hit this wire. Anyway, uh, this South Street Seaport actually was just there on Friday night. I gave a talk right around the corner at the, at, actually I didn't give a talk in the corner. I gave a talk on the Waver Tree, which is this big ship that's in South Street Harbor. That was an interesting experience. Anyway, the rest of Barnard's life was not particularly noteworthy and included stints as a warden of the Port of New York and as a captain of a lightship moored off of Sandy Hook, New Jersey. As you probably know, a lightship is just a lighthouse at sea or in the water. After encouragement from friends, Barnard finally wrote a book about his adventure in the Falkland Islands. It was published in 1829. Barnard died on November 3rd, 13th, 1863 at the age of 83. Few newspapers mourned his passing. One that did, the New York Herald published an announcement that was a mere one sentence long and it said nothing about his time in the Falklands. But a lot of people that deserve to be known better get short obituaries. Herman Melville, when he died in 1891, Harper's Weekly magazine gave him an obituary that was only one sentence long. So I used to say when I gave talks on my whaling book that when I die, the Marblehead reporter better give me at least a paragraph. <laughs> so we'll see if I'm, still, if I'm still there. So anyway, his life ended as has begun in relative obscurity. This is on New Island. This is the Charles H. Barnard Museum. I'm told that inside, well, inside, the tourism office sent me pictures of what's inside, and it's a lot of uh, fishing implements. There's one or two things from the Isabella. There's, it's a, it's a lot about the history of the Falklands fishing, whaling station. Uh, but I gave a talk the other day, and a guy in the audience said, that's not true. He was in the Falklands three months ago, and he went in there. He says it's a souvenir shop. So either the, either the tourist agency has pulled one over on me and they staged it, or since then it's turned into a souvenir shop, but that's fine, because all of New Island is a, is a wildlife preserve. And if you go down there, only a couple of people live on the island. And you, can, you can take a tender and go to the island and walk around. So that is the end of my talk. I'm going to say one more thing, because I always get asked this question. I've given this talk just a couple of times, but I've done a lot of radio interviews and TV interviews recently about this book, and I seem to invariably get asked this question, so I will answer it preemptively. Have I ever been to the Falkland Islands? No. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I wrote a book about whaling, I never killed a whale. I wrote a book about fur trade, I never trapped a beaver. I wrote a book about China, and I've never been to China. Now, I'd love to have gone to the Falkland Islands, but I don't know how much you know about being a writer, but it's not the most lucrative profession in the world. <laughs> Although, fortunately, I've been a full-time writer since 2007, and my lovely wife has always earned a lot more money than me, so that makes it easier. And, but I'm, I'm pretty successful for a writer, but that's just a setup for that, that I wasn't gonna spend the kind of money it was gonna take to go to the Falklands, and I didn't think I would have to to make the Falklands a character, and I'm happy to say that two people who live on the Falklands, one of whom grew up on New Island, read the chap my chapter on the history of the Falklands, and he said, you captured it perfectly. But I told the people on the Falklands who helped me, if my book does really well, I am gonna take Jennifer, and we're gonna go to the Falkland Islands, so basically it's up to you. And, and other people, <laughs> you buy a book. And with that, I do have, I did bring books. I only, I have one, two copies of my pirate book. I don't know any of my other books. But I'm happy to sign and sell a book to you. The hardcover is $30. And I'll say anything you want in the book. I have said, if you've been to one of my talks before, you've probably heard this, but it's too good not to share. One guy had me sign a book once. I couldn't have written this book without you. 
And, 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 a, and, and a, a woman once in Stanford, Connecticut, the Stanford Yacht Club, I actually grew up part of my life in Stanford, but I'd never been to the Yacht Club. They invited me to give a talk. This woman came up, she was laughing, she hands me her book. She goes, I want you to say, Dear Monica, I love you forever, Eric. And so I'm sitting next to a bookseller from a local bookstore. And I turn to her and I say, should I sign that? She goes, I don't know, it's your book. And I said, it's a sale. And I signed it that way. And later that night when I told my wife, Jennifer, she was not amused. <laughs> so anyway, I'm happy to sign it. Oh, it's a great Father's Day gift. <laughs> it is. So anyway, that's it. Thanks for uh, coming. I'm answer I'll answer any questions you have. People, I'm assuming that they have access to these islands off of cruise ships. Yes. Is that on a fairly regular basis? Yeah, there's, there are quite a number of people that visit the Falkland Islands. A lot of them are going on sort of ecology trips. They go to the Falklands, they go to, the, yeah, to Antarctica, they go to the South Shetlands. You can fly into the Falklands. I don't know much about, I think it's more expensive, smaller planes. But a lot of people tend to go, and the people I've met that have been to the Falklands, almost all of them have gone on a cruise ship, not a Disney carnival cruise ship, a smaller cruise ship with maybe 100, 150 people on board that has a naturalist on board, and they go there, and they can't go into the harbors. They, may, they probably can go into Stanley Harbor, the capital, but they usually moor offshore, and then you go into one of their tenders or small boats, and you're taken to the islands to see what's, what's there. And I've heard Falklanders, people who live there, are very nice. I mean, I'd like to visit. We'll see if it happens. <laughs> oh. The sailors. What do they do for entertainment? Did they sing songs? Or was there a <laughs> no, they, well, they didn't record their daily. A lot of their days were spent gathering eggs, killing things. They continued uh, killing seals, even, even creating more pelts, uh, just hanging around. Uh, gathering vines was a big activity to keep their fire going, cutting peat out of the ground. At one point, Charles Bernard taught one of the other sailors a real nasty piece of work, how to read, because they found newspapers on the Eagle Island that were left behind. But how would you spend 534 days? You probably, a lot of it would be just quiet, chatting, playing with the dog, I guess. I bet, I bet they weren't loquacious. They, I don't think they were particularly talkative people. A lot of sailors, you know, Maybe, well, today sailors talk a lot, but back then, I bet they, you know, they chat and they probably ran out of topics. They probably said, what, I wonder what's happening back home. I wonder what's happening with the war. And I bet for a lot of time, they were just quiet. But unfortunately, none of them recorded, well, we talked about this today. We were wondering about the Celtics. You know, I don't know. <laughs> go, go ahead. Oh. oh. I'm curious. I'm curious as to what happened to Scent, the dog. Oh, I, I talk about the very interesting ending. Scent went along with Charles Bernard on the whaling ship, on his adventures, and then finally they pulled into Lima, Peru, where there were other ships. The war was still going on, so um, uh, Barnard had to take another. He had to hop onto another British ship, another British whaling ship. He finally got onto an American ship in Canton. But while he was in port, for whatever reasons, he doesn't describe exactly why he decided to do this, other than saying, well, he gave his dog to the captain of the British whaling ship, hoping that he had found a good home for him. And the only explanation he gave is that he knew that he still had many months, if not a year or more, in front of him trying to make it home. And it was too uncertain of a vagabond life he didn't want to take Scent along. He wanted to give him a good life, and a captain of a major ship would probably be able to do that. And I have no record of what happened to Scent after that. So, yes, oh, right here. Because I'm a Quaker, ah. I'm very intrigued that Bernard was a Quaker. Yes. And I noticed there was a Quaker harbor, so they were. There must have been other Quakers. Oh, yeah. Do Quakers play, play a part? Oh, yeah. Well, Quakers not only play a part in the sealing industry, as you would probably know, Nantucket, a lot of Quakers, a lot of Quakers were involved in whaling, which is interesting. In my book, Leviathan, I muse on, a lot of people have done this. It's kind of interesting. Quaker, you know, you're pacifist in general, but 
you do a great job killing things, kill, killing, <laughs> killing whales. So when profit is involved, they put aside their, their qualms about killing things. They're, they're not humans. But, uh, so yes, Quaker Harbor, it's totally related to being a Quaker. Uh, uh, people that came there, he didn't, uh, he didn't name that. That was named before by whaling ships that had gotten there. A lot of Nantucket whaling ships, even during the American Revolution, believe it or not, uh, Francis Roach, one of the famous Roach family from Nantucket, actually took some of his whaling fleet down to the Falklands for a little while to try to get out of the grasp of war and thought about establishing like an outpost there, but never did. Sorry. There's one in the back. Or, oh, oh. I think it's about 5,600 the last time I looked. That's, uh, don't quote me on that, but I think that's what it is, about 5,600. And most of them are located near Stanley, which is the capital. Like, you remember I mentioned Eagle Island. Two people live on that big island with 60,000 sheep. There are a lot more sheep than there are people in the Falklands. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. None of the people living there are descendants of anybody I talk about in this this book, but a lot of them are descendants uh, are mainly descendants of uh, British people who settled there in the 1830s, 1840s. You know, there's a big dispute between Argentina and before that it was Spain and Britain over who actually owns the island, and still disputed today. And in a funny, not a coincidence, my last book, Rebels at Sea: Privateering, I gave a talk in New York, and afterwards. A guy came up to me, because um, I mentioned that I was writing this book about the Falklands. This guy came up to me, handed me his card. He's with the US State Department. And he either, if I, I can't remember correctly, he either was the head of the Falklands, he, he was in charge of the Falklands, or he used to be. And he goes, do you come to a conclusion on who owns the Falklands, Britain <laughs> or Argentina? And I said, well, I'm working on the book, but I can tell you. I am not going to come to a conclusion in this book because I don't want to get on the wrong side of anybody. And it's actually quite murky because I talk about some of the deep history. It's murky as to who first sighted it. Who first settled there is a little less murky, but there were a lot of things going on between Spain, France, and England in the 1700s on the Falklands. And you can read about them in the book. And I should have added, although he wouldn't get the reference, because but it came up right before this talk, it's for the same reason I am not going to resolve for you where the birthplace of the American Navy is. <laughs> because the actually actually the honest answer is there is no one answer. It totally depends on how you define birthplace. So but if I'm in Marblehead, it's Marblehead. I'm in Beverly, it's Beverly. <laughs> if I'm in Whitehall, New York, it's Whitehall, New York. Providence has a claim, so does Philadelphia. They're all fine with me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can you tell me why it's nothing to do with the book actually? Oh. Why British Britain was fighting the Argentines for that whole area, but what's worth it? Oh no, back then well back then this is an era of when empires like empire building. But the main reason that the Falklands was desired uh, Commodore Anson mentioned this in the mid 1700s is it was considered to be a very good place for getting water and food on the way to the Pacific Ocean or down to South America. So it was considered a strategically, potentially strategically important location. And that's why France, Spain, and Britain sort of fought over it a little bit. Uh, at the end of the 1700s, and why they continue now, it's for other reasons. I'm sure it's for pride, history. Um, you know, they fought a war, undeclared war, in the 1980s, the Falklands War. Maggie Thatcher, there's actually a poster of Maggie someplace. Oh, there she is. Maggie Thatcher, a, der a, a derogatory poster of Maggie. But anyway, um, I take one more question because people probably want to get going. So if there is another question. Yes. Oh, okay. On your map. Yes. The dots were the Nina, and well, the dashes were the little Nina. And I, I, don't, I don't actually know. I, I didn't look at the key. I had to create five different. Yeah, there, there are five different voyages that I talk about. For example, there's there are a set of voyages for the little hunting party boat. There are voyages for the Nina going back and forth to Eagle Island. So you have to look at the key. 
and you will know the answer. I don't remember off the top of my head which long dash or short dash we used. But anyway, but uh, thanks again for coming. I appreciate it.